fellow YouTubers, fellow hams, whoever else may be watching. Well, it's time to move. And uh, as usual, I do a thoughts on the road uh, when I'm getting ready to relocate. So uh, I spent the summer in Kingman again. And uh, <laughs> what a wicked summer it turned out to be. Monsoon season was incredibly active. Um, the storms were intense. I uh, lived through three of the most intense storms I've ever been through in my life, which was an interesting experience. Um, a little terrifying at times, but overall quite exhilarating, quite stimulating, and uh, certainly memories that I'll hold on to and, and revisit as I go through life. Uh, but every cloud has a silver lining, and the active season gave me lots of opportunities for photographs. I took many pictures of big, huge thunderstorms off at a distance. I mean, they could be 30 miles away, and uh, you could clearly see the definition and shape of them, you know. And I really liked taking pictures of them close to sunset because of the way they were illuminated and lit. And occasionally, I'd capture a lightning strike. Um... And uh, yeah, it just—it was just beautiful photographs. I, I, I love the opportunity I get. I mean, look at this panorama here. This massive storm that was sliding by to the north—it just made for one heck of a photograph, you know. Uh, and I had a few that I was really proud of. Um, one in particular, we had an intense sunset. Now the sun was down behind the mountains, but there was so much light reflecting off the clouds that it was illuminating the landscape. You can see how bright this sunset is. And uh, the mountains uh, to the south, the Halapai Mountains, were glowing with this magenta color from the uh, light reflecting off the clouds. And at that point in time, there was a storm moving by to the south. And I was taking some pictures of the lightning, but I worked on the mountains for quite a while photographing and, and waiting and hoping, and I caught a strike. And this is the resulting image. This is one of my favorite images um, from that season. Uh, you can see that I caught one big strike there, and the mountains have this unreal looking color to them and that is the color that they looked to the naked eye the magenta color from the sunset illuminating the mountains so i was really proud of that photograph i love that one uh, um though we had some wildlife you know of course there, there was a, a california king snake that we found uh, tony found in the barn he was moving some boxes and it shot out and startled him and uh, I got a chance to photograph the uh, snake up close. Um, these are constrictors. They don't have fangs. They're not venomous. Uh, but they do have teeth, and their bite can lead to infections. So we were cautious about trying to touch it. Eventually, we just let it loose um, across the fence out into the brush where it has probably a much better chance of finding food than on the property itself. Uh, and uh, I spent about three weeks as caretaker of the property while Tony and Jeannie traveled, and I got to take care of the horse uh, for those three weeks. Of course, two of the storms came through, and you might remember from the, the uh, video, a few videos back titled A Possible Weak Tornado. Um, that was one intense storm, and the, the poor horse, she, uh, while well, her stall was completely destroyed by the neighbor's uh, carport that went flying through the air and actually punched a hole in the shipping container. It hit it so hard. She wasn't in the stall, fortunately. She jumped the fence and I found her later in the front yard. Uh, she weathered the storm okay. Just a few little cuts from going through the fence. But uh, some people were worried and I posted a follow-up video a little while later when she was back home. She went and was taken care of um, by some friends of the owners. Um, but she eventually came back home and uh, I took care of her for the remaining week or so until they got back home. And she was fine. Um, no worse for the wear. Although a little twitchy when the storms came by. Um, we had another storm go, come by and uh, it looks like she's like she's screaming, Hey, there's another storm! She was actually yawning. Uh, but <laughs> it just made for a funny, funny freeze out of the uh, video I was shooting. 
I like that horse. And uh, she's not afraid of the drone. And I captured another photograph that I'm real proud of. Uh, this one here that I call shadow dancing or yin yang. Um, and uh, you can see it's a, it's a, it's a heck of a picture, uh, her and her shadow. So yeah, the, uh, the summer was uh, pretty eventful there. And uh, I'm not gonna stick around next summer for monsoon. Uh, I'm gonna visit Tony and Jeannie until uh, probably June. Somewhere in June when the storm season's starting to kick up, I'm gonna find someplace else to be. Uh, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna go through those storms there in Kingman again. Uh, once was enough. Um, well, twice was enough, I guess, because two years ago we also had another big one that I did a film on. So uh, yeah, um, I'm relocated uh, down to my quiet spot outside of Quartzsite. Now it's still a little hot down here. Uh, I like to get here at the early part of the season. Um, it's, it's still hot. There's not a lot of RVs here yet. I kind of have the place mostly to myself, which I like. I love that quiet and solace of it. I just took a walk this morning and, and I saw one other person on the trail. Um, and I can look around and not see hardly anybody around me. So right now I kind of have the place to myself, but it is a bit hot. It's okay though. Um, it's only about four hours of the day that are uncomfortable. Uh, the afternoon from about 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. is when it uh, really gets toasty. Up close to 100. In fact, we'll have a few days that'll, that'll hit 100 uh, to 101 Fahrenheit which is right around 40 Celsius uh, for, the, for the rest of you, not in the US, um, pretty hot. So I have to get my work done in the mornings. Um, I've got the antenna up, I got the big doublet back up, which is great. Uh, and uh, yesterday actually 15 meters was open and I worked into a New Zealand station with 10 watts with the uh, 705. Uh, so yeah, right now it's, it's wonderful for radio out here. The bands are dead quiet, there's no, uh, no noise. Noise floor is S0. Um, you, it almost sounds like there's no antenna connected sometimes when I when I turn the radio on until a signal comes blasting through. It's just ideal. In about another three weeks, there'll be more RVs around and there'll be a lot of hash noise from their solar charge controllers and their inverters uh, that they, they all run. Uh, it gets pretty noisy, almost like an urban neighborhood um, in a city, you know. Uh, but uh, right now it's peaceful and I can deal with those four hours in the afternoon, uh, deal with the heat. I bring a little extra water. I have a couple of gallon jugs I fill up and I call it cool down water. And uh, what I do, since the air is so dry out here, is I have a small towel that I soak with water and then I just drape it over my head. And uh, through evaporative cooling, it creates a bubble of cool air around my head. And uh, I think the brain, is number one for heat generation in the body or number two? It's the liver and the brain are at the top of the list and I can't remember which is number one, which is number two. I think the brain is the most major heat source in the body. The liver is number two. Um, and it's all, you know, those, those are the most chemically active organs. The brain, of course, billions of chemical reactions going on constantly as, as neural transmitters are being released and crossing synaptic gaps and picked up by the receptors and then stimulating the cell to produce a, a little electrical signal that goes across to another synapse and releases more neural transmitter. Billions upon billions of chemical reactions going on constantly in the brain and uh, that generates a lot of heat. And then of course the liver is the chemical factory of the body, body where everything's produced and there's all kinds of chemical reactions going on there so that also produces a lot of heat. But if you cool your head, um, it makes all the difference. I'll, I'll put that damp towel over my head and during the worst of it, I'll sit out in the shady side of the RV in the shade with the breeze and uh, watch the clouds drift by for a while. Or I'll lay down in here and put a fan on me and drape a damp towel over my body, which is like an inverse of a blanket. It'll be cool instead of warm. And I'll just take a nap, you know, and just wait for the uh, late part of the day when the sun gets low in the sky and goes down and, and uh, get back into to doing things. I, uh, I shut most of the stuff down during that part period too. Lithium batteries do not like heat. Um, my phone I had to replace it this summer. Um, the uh, heat, I was using it when it was hot like that and uh, the battery puffed up, you know, 
and the battery in my laptop puffed up. I haven't replaced it yet. I'm just using it off of the uh, solar power because uh, it's $160 for a battery. And to be honest, I only used it uh, portable as a laptop twice since I've got it. It's always plugged in here at the desk, so I haven't replaced the battery yet. It's kind of like a small desktop computer, which is fine. I might replace the battery eventually. I don't know. Depends upon my use case, you know. Right here in the RV, it sits on my desk. That's where I use it, so uh, don't really need the battery. But uh, yeah, I shut everything down. Um, I put things low to the floor, like the phone spends the uh, afternoon in airplane mode sitting down on the floor where it's about four degrees cooler, five degrees cooler, uh, so I don't have its battery fail on me again. Um, so yeah, just, you know, I have to, I have to adapt my, uh, my lifestyle a little bit for this heat, but it's only going to last about a week, week and a half, and then the uh, temperatures are already starting to drop. I mean, uh, two weeks ago here near Quartzsite, it was hitting 110, 112 degrees, which is what, 41, 42 Celsius. I mean, it was getting hot, uh, but uh, we're already in the cool down. So in another, uh, in another couple of weeks, um, we'll be in the upper 80s, uh, sometimes tickle in the 90s, um, which I got to do the conversions. I, I think it's somewhere around 35 to 36 Celsius, roughly. Um, so still warm, but not uncomfortably so. Uh, in fact, I'm, I get comfortable when the temperature hits uh, 84 Fahrenheit. That's my comfort temperature, uh, which is a little warm for a lot of people, but I've adapted to the desert. You know, I've adapted to the heat, and uh, that's where I'm comfortable. And with the dry air, your perspiration evaporates instantly. Um, you're, it, it's very efficient, and uh, your body can cool itself very well. So... It, th that, that old saying, it's, but it's a dry heat, and it's actually true. Um, the dry air makes a lot of difference in how efficient your perspiration is, and your body will cool itself much better. So you're more comfortable. You just stay out of the sun. That's the, the main thing. So anyway, I'm uh, in my quiet spot. Um, I'm very relaxed <laughs> after the tension of... Uh, of the storms in the summer and the responsibilities up there. I mean, you know, when you're responsible for somebody else's property, it's it's a weight, you know. It, it, it occupies your thoughts, and uh, it's harder to relax when you've got things you have to be concerned with, uh, you know. And here, my only responsibilities are my own. Um, I don't have, I'm not responsible for anybody else's problems, issues, or property, or, or anything. It's just me. And I find a great deal of solace in that, so... That's why I come here. Uh, my month and a half or so here is my breath of fresh air before I get back into um, the thick of things in society, uh, such as it is the fringe of society out here. Uh, and looking forward, well, uh, I'm going to be here probably through mid-November at least, maybe into later November, but I'll be uh, leaving once it starts to get crowded, because this is Quartzsite. This is the uh, center point of the snowbirds out here in the West. Um, the population here goes from a few thousand to over a million in December and January as all of the RVers come down. I mean, just hundreds of thousands of RVs come to this area uh, for those two months. And I was planning on going to the Gulf Coast of Texas and visiting Al and my friends there. It's 1,200 miles though, and uh, the old RV, she's showing her age and uh, there's a couple of things um, that might change my mind. I'm still debating, but I might just go down to Yuma again uh, and set with the Rat Pack this winter. Um, two reasons. One is I'm not that comfortable uh, with this old RV taking it on a 1,200-mile road trip. Um, I... I eh, you know, it's starting to have small mechanical issues that I have to deal with. And I don't want a major one. I don't want something to go wrong with the drivetrain when I'm in the middle of Texas. Um, you know, out, out in the, the western Texas, the big open plains area, because there's not a lot of uh, populace out there, not a lot of cities. Uh, but also money. Um, I think that since the next summer, June, uh, I'm planning on leaving Kingman and probably going somewhere up into Utah 
up into a higher elevation to escape the heat and get out of the main storm activity. Uh, that will take money and uh, I should probably, if I'm smart, just go down to Yuma this winter with the Rat Pack and just save money um, through the winter so that uh, summer I've got uh, a little put aside for that travel because uh, if I'm going to be traveling July and August up in Utah uh, there's going to be additional expenditures of gas uh, maybe state park fees if I decide to spend a couple weeks at a state park um, I'll probably look for look for state parks so I can do some parks on the air activations that's one thing I definitely want to do um, was planning on doing in Texas but uh, oh and Al I know you're watching this and you're going oh darn uh, and me too man I really wanted to come visit but uh, if I end up somehow magically being able to afford a van and I get into a van uh, then I'll definitely come visit because it'll be easier to travel <laughs> but van prices are still utterly ridiculous uh, even the the used high mileage somewhat beat up uh, sprinter vans cost two to three times what i paid for the house i had in fort wayne <laughs> that's my my benchmark i mean yeah i bought the house in the 90s 1990s but i paid thirty five thousand dollars for that house i was in which was in a nice neighborhood and it was a decent little bungalow you know um and you see a used sprinter van that's high mileage for eighty to ninety thousand dollars. That's that's ridiculous, uh, completely ridiculous for a used vehicle. That's I, I, unfathomable to me, you know. Um, so I'm keeping my eye out. Maybe I'll fall into an incredible deal somewhere that I can afford. But uh, who knows? What I would like to do is I'd like to get into a van and get a small trailer and then use the uh, the camper trailer to winter here in the uh, long-term areas in southwest Arizona because I do like the desert I love this spot that I'm at my quiet spot my secret spot I don't tell people where it's at because I come here to get away you know I get I get recognized a lot um, just about anywhere I go somebody if, if it's you know at all technical ham radio related somebody will walk up to me that sees my videos and you know I spend time talking to them sure you know it's I'm, I'm courteous but uh, here for a little while it's just me and uh, that for me is a breath of fresh air so anyhow uh, if I if I fall into an incredible deal and I get a van uh, and a small trailer then I'll spend the uh, the summer or well, the, the six or yeah six or so months um, of the year uh, during the summer traveling around the country you know there's places I'd like to go I'd like to go up to I'd like to go up to Montana I've never been to Montana um, I'd like to go to uh, parks in, in some of the states out here you look at the parks on the air database and there are parks out here that have never been activated that have zero activations and it would be fun to make that my mission you know go and find uh, zero activation parks and activate them um, that'd be great you know but I'm not going to do it in this 31 foot behemoth uh, <laughs> traveling with this thing the, the major problem with traveling with such a big RV is finding a place to safely park every night uh, when you're traveling it's like rest areas which you can't really sleep too well at you know with big trucks all night long people talking and walking past you know it's just, it's hard to it's hard to sleep and then uh, you got RV parks but those are um, noisy again because you know they're they're everybody's parked in close to each other so you have to listen to everybody else's music and conversations and dogs barking and so on it's like being in a, in a city neighborhood again uh, so yeah this big RV um, traveling is, is is a lot of work finding the place to park every day is a lot of work if I had a van I could park in a strip mall buy buy something at one of the small stores get a two or three hour snooze and get back on the road you know and you, you, your options just open up as far as where you can park a van versus this thing so that would be the ideal scenario I just don't know how I'm gonna ever make that happen uh, with the uh, price of vans but I'm keeping my eyes open you know I'm, I check listings I look around I 
talk to people. I, I keep my ear open for, for an opportunity because sometimes they happen. Uh, I had a friend up in Oregon tell me about uh, a friend of his that lucked onto an incredible deal. Some, uh, some guy had a sprinter van that his son had used uh, for van life or thought he'd try it and didn't like it after a few months and just left it at his dad's. And uh, his dad wanted to get rid of it and he sold it for $8,000. <laughs> it was already partially built out as a camper van and my friend's friend got it for $8,000. So sometimes those incredible deals do pop up and I just got to keep my ears open for it. So uh, yeah, I'm uh, back in my quiet spot and I'm going to get back to work. Um, I got the uh, double it up and I also put up the end fed half wave for 40 so I'd have a resonant antenna. So the doublet I use in here with the 705 and my antenna tuner and then I've got the resonant antenna up for when I'm sitting out on the shady side of the RV to play around with uh, the true SDX. So we're going to we're going to start working on uh, playing around with that radio. I've got some uh, some ideas for some projects around it that I think will be popular and, and other people can take advantage of. And of course the first one is what I've already mentioned is going to be a, a Anderson power poles shell with built-in strain relief uh, for the power cord for it, but it's it's a project that I think will be valuable to other people too. Uh, I'll put it up on Thingiverse and other people can download it and make a, a connector and a shell for their Anderson power poles uh, power lines with strain relief, which is the one thing I haven't found on Thingiverse. Nobody's made one that I can see that uh, clamps on the uh, on the incoming cable to provide strain relief. So that's uh, that's what I'm going to start designing. And I can 3D print out here on solar. Um, although I got to get everything done in the morning, so I'll have to uh, <laughs> I'll have to get the 3D printer out about 4 a.m. and start the print job on battery. Uh, so that it's done before noon when the heat really rises because it gets just too hot. Um, the printer itself probably wouldn't mind the heat, but its, uh, it's internal electronics and power supply might not like the heat. So, <laughs> so that's that. Uh, anyway, that's the update. That's what's going on. I'm moved and uh, we're starting the winter loop. And I'll probably end up down with the rat pack again near Yuma this winter. Still thinking about it. Um, you know, my mind might change. It depends on a lot of factors, fuel cost, weather, um, how I feel about the RV. Um, yeah, so that's that. Okay. Well, I'll get back to work. Um, we'll see you in the next video, which will be true SDX related. It'll either just be me playing around with it out here in the, uh, in the shade, making some contacts, or it'll be the, uh, power supply or power line connector. And then I got an idea for a USB interface for it, for a single USB connection for doing digital modes. Um, cheap and easy to build, much cheaper than a signal link, uh, even easier to build than my Duino box because it'll use uh, passive electronics for the box circuit. But uh, I, I'm, I'm working that out in my head. I think you'll dig it when I put it together. I've already got the uh, parts for it. So moving on, we'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you're not already a subscriber, click to subscribe. Join us on the Facebook channel for discussion about the videos. And if you'd like to help support this channel, please click to support me on my Patreon page.